Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on the time zone that you're zooming in from. Thanks for joining us for our conversation on proving and improving your company's social impact without overburdening your nonprofit partners. I'm Katie Elder, Vice President of Corporate Insights here at Points of Light. And for those who may not be familiar with our organization, we are a global, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization with a mission to inspire, equip, and mobilize people to take action that changes the world. We partner with companies, NGOs around the globe, including an affiliate network in 39 different countries, and with individuals who are interested in doing good. And to dive just a little bit deeper into our work with companies, on a daily basis, my teammates and I have the privilege of connecting with and working alongside companies in their social impact work. We host sector events like the Points of Light Conference and smaller learning opportunities like this webinar today. We convene leading companies through our Corporate Service Council, and we can facilitate your team's strategic planning session, create a toolkit for your employee volunteer champions, or coordinate your week or month of service and a whole lot more as you see on the screen. But the question we'll be tackling today is one we hear a lot from CSR leaders like yourselves. Those CSR leaders who wanna measure the impact of their social impact strategy and either don't know where to begin or have realized that their methods and needs are overtaxing their grantees and community partners. But not to worry. We've brought in an expert who can help you get started with or reimagine data collection in a way that supports your needs and your partner's needs, which will allow you to not only prove the impact of your company's efforts, but also improve them in both the short and long term. Today, you'll be hearing from Sarah Ansel, Senior Social Impact Manager at True Impact. She supports clients through philanthropic analysis, research, benchmarking, instrument development, and project management, just to name a few skills that Sarah excels at. She also has a ton of nonprofit experience, which is incredibly valuable when it comes to helping companies hone their data collection methods so that they know the impact of their work while aligning with the abilities and capacity of their partners. Plus, she can explain it in a, intimidating concepts like impact measurement in a way that we can all understand, which is another incredibly important skill. I'd be remiss if I didn't share that Points of Light has enjoyed a valued partnership with True Impact for many years. As administrator of the Civic 50, which recognizes the top 50 most community-minded companies in the nation each year, and as presenters at our corporate social impact events, both large and small. We've also got another remarkable leader with us today, Nate Brown, Senior Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility at PIMCO and Director of the PIMCO Foundation. You'll get a chance to hear from him after Sarah's brilliant presentation. Speaking of, I know we're all anxious to get started, but one last bit of housekeeping. Should a question arise during the presentation or discussion today, please share it with us using the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll do our best to save time toward the end of the webinar to answer them. All right, let's welcome Sarah to the virtual stage. I bet she is joining us today from a blustery uh, Madison, Wisconsin, right? I am. We're it's so actually excited pretty to have nice. Oh, it's good. Nice in Wisconsin, you would expect, but we've had a couple of, of good days. Uh, so hi, everybody. It's so nice to see you. I was scrolling through your names and many of you are familiar to me. So that's lovely to see names that I know. And uh, it's so nice to meet uh, new folks. So um, I am going to speak for about 20 minutes on impact measurement um, and am happy to answer questions later uh, if we can't get to all your good questions. But first, I'm going to start with a question of my own, uh, which is a uh, I'm curious about uh, the room here. So I'm curious about your comfort level with measurement um, and how it's working for you. So I want to give you guys a few minutes to respond. I believe a poll, yes, the poll is going to pop up and you guys can respond to that. Um, and the options are, uh, you know, we aren't getting a lot of great data, but the benefit is we're not having to ask for our nonprofits to turn away from the good work that they're doing. Um, 
Next option is we found a really good sweet spot there. You know, we ask for only the information that we really need um, and try not to, you know, burden our nonprofit partners. And we get everything we need. It's really robust. We recognize that it, it does uh, take a lot of time for the nonprofits to do that work, but we don't really know how to extricate ourselves from that really rigorous data collection without asking what we have to ask of our partners. So I'm curious. Uh, if I believe I can get access to kind of real-time results here. So I'm curious about where folks fall on this spectrum. Um, and I think even if, uh, you know, mostly the takeaway here that I wanted to share with you guys is these are important questions to be considering for yourselves as you're thinking about your, your CSR work and engaging uh, your nonprofit partners as the recipients of your volunteerism efforts or your grant giving. Uh, so as you bring this kind of lens into the room, um, I, I am excited to share more about best practices when it comes to measurement. It looks as though the majority of folks are not really getting the information that you need, uh, but you feel comfortable with that because you're not burdening your nonprofits. So helpful because I think we can move folks to option two, which is really that sweet spot. So let's talk a little bit more about that sweet spot. Um, so a little bit about True Impact. We've been in this work since 2005, and this work being impact measurement. Uh, we have a measurement uh, solutions platform that allows you to measure the impact of your volunteerism, your grant giving, uh, in-kind donations, et cetera. But baked into that uh, system is a lot of thinking around how do you measure the impact of what you do, and how do you find that sweet spot between getting the information that you need without burdening your partners. And so that's really what I'll be focused on today. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of a story here about what you're looking at. So I, I wish I could like have you guys raise hands because I'm curious who's familiar with Philadelphia. Um, but what you're looking at is um, uh, Philadelphia from kind of North Broad Street. I lived in Philly for many, many years. Um, and what you're seeing is um, one of the many murals in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia, if you don't know it, is the mural capital of the world, most murals per, per capita. And um, that was my work for many years. I led um, a department within the city of Philadelphia mural arts program, and we leveraged the power of public art to improve public health. Um, and so this mural that you're seeing is about 300 and so feet wide and about 85 feet tall. Um, and inside the word rise are self-portraits, six foot by six foot self-portraits of the individuals that created this mural. The individuals that created this mural uh, were adults who were dealing with substance use challenges uh, and were in treatment for that substance use challenge. Um, and they worked with the lead artist, James Burns, uh, to create this mural. On one side of the building, it says rise, and on the other side of the building, it says shine, rise and shine. And the reason that this mural came into creation is because James, our artist, met with the, uh, the folks that were a part of this project and said, as a part of the ongoing discussions with them, when's the last time that you felt safe, that you felt secure? And one of the adults said, it was when I was a kid, and my mom would wake me up and say, rise and shine, honey. And I can't even talk about it without getting emotional. And the group agreed that that message of rise and shine was too powerful not to share with the city as a whole. And this was one of many projects that we did around the city with this message of belonging, uplifting, well-being, um, and we had the Yale School of Medicine come in and assess the impact of this work. My job was to direct this program, to direct the work. And I also had to report to our funders, of which we had many. And I can't tell you <laughs> how frustrating that was for me because I believed in the power of the work. The participants believed in it. The lead artist believed in it. And it was so hard to have to tell funders about how many paintbrushes their funding bought, or how many hours their volunteers spent at our paint site. I wanted to talk to them about the power of the message. I wanted to say your funding went to something much bigger than paintbrushes. It went to 
the ability for a community to see themselves differently. It went to the individuals who suddenly had a sense of purpose that they lacked before. It went to organizations that had seen themselves as mental health crisis centers that became de facto community centers. So the work was so powerful. And the funders and those that, that provided money and time were missing the point when they focused on paintbrushes. So I just ate up so much of my time because I really want you all to understand that tension between tracking how many paintbrushes did we buy or how many hours did our volunteers spend and the real impact of the work, the transformation of individuals, of organizations, of communities. So how can you focus on something bigger than the paintbrush. So in the work that I did for many years, I really saw the good, the bad, the ugly. I saw funders requiring very specific reports, how many paintbrushes did our funding support? I also saw funders that then as a result, weren't able to speak to the broader impact of the work because they were so focused on those paintbrushes. I saw nonprofits scrambling to talk about the work in different ways to speak to funder priorities. Uh, and I also saw nonprofits feel really burdened by the tracking process that they felt were required in order to report to their funders. So if you can get impact measurement right and find that sweet spot, it allows you to, as a CSR program, stay focused on your purpose, build true credibility with your stakeholders, amplify what's working, and identify what isn't working and what might need improvement. Within your investment of time and money, within that strategy of, of donation, as well as at the nonprofit level, what's working well in some partners' um, efforts and what might need some additional support. So there really is a sector-wide opportunity here to think about how grants, volunteerism, employee giving, all of these different ways in which your CSR work is supporting the broader community can really be systematically and, and in, in, with kind of fidelity to some uh, very clear methodology. How can it all, all of those different kinds of donations be measured and really focus on that end outcome, the transformation of people's lives, their organizations or their communities? So not only, you know, does this just feel exciting and right and good, <laughs> also there's increasing reason to bring that structure and, um, you know, clear methodology to your impact measurement because, you know, this work is really transforming. Um, you know, previously in the 90s, it was acceptable that, you know, you had a mission statement in your CSR program. Then it was really focused on the output, you know, how much time or money you're donating. Then after that, there was a little bit of focus on, well, okay, you gave time and money, but how many people were really touched by that? And now the focus really is not just how many people were touched by that, is what's the actual end result? What comes from that engagement? You know, how are you really transforming people's lives? How are you helping people find permanent housing, for example? So there's real reason uh, to, to move towards a more systemized you know, method in measurement. Um, also, it supports the nonprofit partner. When done right, it really can support the nonprofit partner. It would have given me the ability to talk about the power of the art instead of counting those paintbrushes. So how can we do this? How can we find that sweet spot between supporting your partners, giving them the room to talk about their work and also gather the information that you need? Uh, so I'm gonna spin through it. <laughs> there are four golden rules that I'd love you all to remember. Keep it simple, keep it timely, keep it uniform, keep it supportive. So let's dig into each one of these. Keep it simple. This is really, don't count the paintbrushes. Stay focused on the art. Count what counts. So first and foremost, let's make sure that we are using the same language. Inputs are the things that support the program. So this might be the time of the volunteers, the donation. Maybe it's donation of equipment or office space. The outputs are the activities of the program. So maybe it's the meals that are delivered, the workshops that are held, or the people that enroll in the program. The outcomes 
are the, the actual impacts, how people's lives are transformed. So this is how people benefit in terms of their health, their well-being, their income, their education, et cetera. And when I say count what counts, I'm saying focus on the outcomes. Don't ask about the paintbrushes. Focus on the end result of the work. So for example, if you were to break this down, you might have you might know the number of, uh, or the value, excuse me, of the donations. You might also be able to track how many people were reached, but really the outcomes are the most critical piece and being able to identify what are those impacts, those end outcomes of your donation, of the time that you spent or the grant that you provided. That's really where you want to stay laser focused. Once you have a good sense of those outcomes, that's when you can really start leveraging that data. There's another piece here, and I feel like I've been saying this probably since the beginning, which is ask for your nonprofit's whole story. Don't just ask them, how did you use our funding? Or how did those three hours of volunteer time get used? What were their activities? It's really, what are we supporting? What's the bigger arc of your program that we are supporting? Stay focused on, or rather let your nonprofit stay focused on telling their whole story. And then from that, you can pull the details that you need in order to share back to your stakeholders what your donation supported. So this allows your nonprofit partners to stay focused on that comprehensive report that says, let me tell you about Rise and Shine. Let me tell you about that power of the art. And then from there, you can pull out the impacts that are uh, attributable to your work and align with your CSR's mission and focus. So. The other piece of keeping it simple, as I just said, is to pull out the part of the work that's attributable to your donation. And the way that we do that in kind of measurement speak is to calculate your impact claim. So let's say we know back in my mural arts days that a hundred and let's keep the, let's keep the math simple, a hundred people's lives were improved because of the work that they did in the participatory public art. What we then on the funder side of things, would calculate the percentage of those 100 people whose lives were improved that are attributable to our donation. Here's the math. Percent funded is the percent claim. That's our recommended methodology for calculating the percentage of the impacts that you can claim. Now, notice I say percent funded. Even if you're donating volunteer time, you can always transform that into the value of that time. And I can share more with you about the methodology behind that. But once you understand the value of that time, you then have the number that you need to understand what the percentage of the overall budget of that program that you supported uh, would yield in terms of your percent claim. So in order for you to do this contribution calculation, you have to understand what's that overall impact of the program. How many lives were transformed as a result of the program? How much did the program cost? How much does it cost the program to run? And what was the value of your donation? When you have those three variables, then you can calculate your claim. So if we know a program helps 250 people improve academic performance, you provided a million of a $2 million cost there, then your claim is 50% of that, but of that uh, program impact. So 125 people improved their academic performance because of your donation. You have freed the nonprofit from speaking to your money specifically or your time specifically. You're allowing them to talk about their work and you can pull out the pieces that are attributable to you. Keeping it timely is the next kind of golden rule. So here's what I mean by that. I wish that I had better understood from my funders back in the nonprofit work that I did, what the requirements were for reporting. And it sounds so simple, but I was thrown curveball after curveball about when I needed to report on certain pieces. So this might sound pretty basic, you guys, but just being very upfront about the reporting requirements and providing adequate time is going to be really important. This next piece is probably the most important, and it's it's a little in the weeds, but I think it really has value, which is so often funders will say, please report on our grant cycle. Please tell me, please report out on, tell me the number of impacts that were achieved during the last grant period. 
I really encourage you all to consider asking the nonprofit when their program operates. Our program and the nonprofit work that I did really operated on a September to October timeframe uh, for lots of different reasons. And I was constantly bending over backwards to report on a July to June framework for various funders. If as a donor, you can say, you tell us when you spent the funds and report on that time frame, that again, frees your nonprofits from doing bespoke reports for your donation. It frees them to talk about their work as it happens in the natural cycle that it happens. And it gives you more accurate information. My numbers were so hard to figure out when I was doing all of these different time periods. So it ensures more accuracy from your nonprofit partners. It gives more transparency into when they're using the funds. And it gives them a much clearer cadence for annual reporting because it's based on their program cycle. Okay, keep it uniform. So we recommend I keep saying focus on the end outcomes. And you might say, well, what does that really mean in practice? Here's what that means in practice. We recommend focusing on these key pieces in your reporting requests. It's not that many, right? So it's eight. <laughs> program description, their mission. So tell us what the purpose of your program is. Tell us a little bit about how the program works, what the activities are. Tell us a little bit about those that are served by this program. Tell us about when the program happens, coming back to the keep it timely golden rule. Number five, most important, tell us about your theory of change. So you're creating art. What's the end outcome? What are you hoping to achieve or what have you achieved with this particular intervention? Tell us a little bit more about how you're measuring this information. You say that 100 people's lives were changed. How do you know that? You know, what? how are you defining lives are changed and what? what's your impact how are you measuring that or how are you estimating that? Um, or are you, quite frankly, are you having to rely on kind of a hunch here, but at least be transparent? You're asking your partners to be transparent about that. How much does all of that cost? And if you're doing some sort of retrospective reporting, a success story or lesson learned is always valuable uh, when you're thinking about pulling in qualitative information. So we recommend these key pieces to any reporting request. Okay, so the last golden rules, keep it supportive. And this is really encompassing our overall perspective here at Trimpact, which is the work of measurement cannot be done if it's not in communication and in collaboration with your nonprofit partners. So understanding what their reporting needs and challenges are, offering feedback to highlight strengths or to suggest improvements in what you see uh, of their measurement practices, of their you know, overall reporting approach. And we really uh, wanna amplify the trust-based philanthropy values. We find them you know, really salient in this work. So keeping an eye on how you're centering relationships, how you're embracing learning, uh, this is core to what good measurement looks like in practice. Um, we do have a little template that I put together of how you might solicit feedback on your reporting process. So feel free to check out the funder resources link here if you'd like a little more information on how you might engage in dialogue with your partners about the reporting process. Keep it supportive. Uh, again, another iteration of this really means emphasizing learning and improvement and allocating funds for capacity building. You guys are gonna hear more from Nate in just a minute. Uh, and I'm so grateful you can hear from him because Nate is a master of thinking about how do we meet the needs of our nonprofit partners through volunteerism, through grant giving, and really think about what kind of support they would benefit most from in, in order for them uh, to do their incredible work uh, in, a, in a stronger way uh, and measure that work well. Okay, so I've got, Couple minutes, two more minutes here. So once you've been, you've really internalized those four golden rules, you have at your disposal a lot of really rich information that you can use to share your story, your CSR team's story of impact. So you can ladder up particular outcomes from your partners to your overall impact goal or to your pillars, et cetera. 
You might find that some of the impacts of your partners don't perfectly align. That's okay. As long as they are reasonably aligned to what you do, I, what I would recommend funders to do is to recognize that not every impact of your partners is going to match the, the most specific impact you're seeking. As long as they are focused on on one or more of your goals, then you can pull that information into your overall impact story. Always, of course, stay focused on your claimed impacts, the number of impacts that you can reasonably claim that are attributable to your donation using that claim calculation that you guys are now experts in, I'm sure. Um, also, think about where there's alignment. So are your nonprofits well aligned to the demographics that matter most, the cause areas, the geographic Another way to say this is the who, the what, and the where. So again, you might find that the impacts may not perfectly align. However, there is a key impact that matters a great deal to your focus area and that nonprofit partners really focus on the demographics that matter most to your mission. So think about how there might be kind of the Venn diagram of alignment between the who, the what, and the where, and communicate all of that to your stakeholders. I have a lot of clients that use internal dashboards. They do their board presentations with impact data. They share information out in purpose reports or sustainability reports, and of course, PR and news articles. Um, one last thing I'll come back to this is often I find that my, my clients uh, have a good problem at the end of this and that they realize once they start sharing this rich impact data that is grounded in good measurement, they're asked for more information. And so you might need to expand your reporting. But if you have that standardized approach that is simplified, expansion isn't all that difficult. Um, I just want to make sure you have a chance to, if you want to go to muralarts.org, um, feel free and check out more of the good work that's happening there. And you can always look at funder resources that we've compiled on our website if you'd like to learn more about other recommended best practices. Okay, I think I'm one minute over, but I'm gonna stop here and welcome Katie back so we can introduce Nate to the conversation. Thank you, Sarah. What an exciting um, presentation. I have to say that we were getting a lot of folks from the audience who were sharing how thankful they were for being here and for you for sharing those tips, so thank you. So now we're gonna bring Nate into conversation on what thoughtful impact measurement looks like in practice. And as I mentioned earlier, Nate is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility at PIMCO and is also a director of the PIMCO Foundation. And for those who may not be familiar, PIMCO is a global leader in active fixed income with deep expertise across both public and private markets. Their foundation and purpose work focuses on two incredibly important community issues, hunger and gender equality, which aligns with SDGs two and five. Nate oversees the firm's global philanthropic giving portfolio, including creating and leading programming and the impact strategy for the foundation. Prior to joining PIMCO, he was the senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where he awarded grants to improve U.S. educational outcomes. So I would definitely say Nate knows his way around measurement and analysis, and we're grateful to have him here in conversation with Sarah. Welcome, Nate, and congratulations again on PIMCO being a 2023 Civic 50 honoree. So, I'm really proud of that. Thank you. <laughs> we are very proud, too. And I know True Impact is as well. So I'm going to start off with an easy question, or at least it looked easy when I wrote it down. Tell us a little bit about PIMCO's impact measurement journey and any lessons learned. Great. And thanks um, for letting me be part of this. I always learn so much from you, Sarah, every time you speak. You're both a tough act to follow and a wonderful act to follow at the same time. So um, thank you. Um, so and it, it's great. Also, I see um, some of my uh, former colleagues on this call who actually can speak to this journey as well. Um, but um, our uh, journey really started about six, seven years ago when we made that alignment to the SDGs, focusing on SDGs two and five, gender equality. Uh, zero hunger and gender equality, respectively. Um, um, we're also, as Katie noted, a asset management firm. We're all about the numbers. We're all about data. That's just in our DNA. And the combination really created fertile ground for a robust impact measurement framework. Um, and um, as Katie noted, I spent um, you know a lot of my career in this data uh, measurement evaluation space, particularly at the Gates Foundation. Um, and just by context, you know, at the Gates Foundation, we had 
a, you know, there were teams of PhD folks that were assigned to each one of our program areas. And those folks um, partnered often with third parties, uh, measurement evaluation organizations, and even universities around um, trying to understand the impact of our funding globally. And um, 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 also at my, my time at um, Gates taught me about how difficult um, reporting, how burdensome reporting can be for nonprofit partners. Um, and we worked really hard to actually reduce that burden and try to make our data actionable um, and helpful for our, our partners. But it's really, really tough, especially when partners are, nonprofit partners are reporting to so many different funders with different value, different request, you know, it's just, it's really tough. Um, so um, it was really, when we started to build out this framework, um, it became very obvious that our small but mighty team wasn't able to, didn't have the internal capacity to do this. Um, um, and this is um, um, why we uh, decided to work with True Impact um, to, as our sort of key partner. True Impact not only had, um, it has, um, um, a track record around this, but also a network um, of people who are serious about this work. Um, and most importantly, I would say they shared our value around minimizing the burden and maximizing the utility of the data for partners. And um, dare I say ambition, uh, ambition to precedent set. Um, there's a huge opportunity between uh, to, to find a sweet spot between what, you know, the Gates Foundations of the world are doing and all the resources that they can put to this because this is their primary business um, and what corporations who really want to meaningfully give back um, can and should do. Um, and um, when we found uh, this partnership just to be incredibly helpful and productive and we cannot, uh, I mean, it's not meant to be an info, infomercial <laughs> about True and Back, but they have just been incredible thought partners with us along this journey. Um, so phase one for us was to actually engage our nonprofit partners in the creation of a logic model, um, logic models, um, as well as um, KPIs, identify KPIs that would most resonate or most important. They're the experts um, in their work. So we, um, so we, so we canvassed them and asked them to meaningfully engage with us around this, um, as well as the process around how we would um, 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 capture, collect, report out on their data. Um, uh, phase two was to actually, you know, put these, uh, put this framework to use. So we asked our partners to project what they thought their impacts would be based on what uh, Sarah shared earlier. Um, and then uh, we asked them to, you know, report back. And we, um, each time, used that information to refine our um, our, our framework, and we um, asked them, and we um, use those data to you to make um, consequential decisions from the very beginning. Um, they helped us um, build a case for reinvestment in, in, in many of our partners, which is super important. Um, now we've um, you're sitting on about five years of um, you know pretty solid historical data, and um, this year we've actually used those data. Uh, our own data um, benchmarked against other organizations, other um, foundations um, grant making to um, set goals and targets for our focus areas. And that's super exciting because now we have a North Star against which we can shoot or towards which we can shoot and, um, um, and, 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 and inform our investment strategy. So lessons learned. Um, I just will say, this is my shameless plug. We're always learning. And and I'd love people to come alongside and learn with us. So anybody on this call, whether you're listening live or in the recorded version, uh, it, we would love to learn from you. If you want to join us in this 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 process, you know, we'd love to to um, learn alongside you. Um, so please, um, uh, my information, I'm sure you can find on this uh, on LinkedIn or you know through this um, format. But uh, I'd love to um, to engage more partners in this work. Uh, that said. Um, I say our first lesson was looking at our data. Um, we, you know, we're a global firm, and our our grant making and volunteerism and um, and advocacy are worldwide. And um, when we looked specifically at our grants and tried to understand the impact, we saw we naturally thought about um, geography as a lens. We fund food banks. Um, it's a huge part of our funding our food banks. And we said, okay, well, a food bank, how does a food bank in Milan compare to a food bank 
in you know Orange County. Um, and um, you know we we quickly learned with Sarah's help that actually that's not the appropriate lens for us. What's much more telling is the kind of investment. So when we were able to categorize our uh, and sort our grants based on whether or not they're doing direct service or uh, capacity building or systems level um, work, then that's how we actually see some meaningful differences um, in, in, some, in, in some cases, the majorly scaled um, you know, exponential differences. Um, and, it, and it forced us to say, look, direct service is really important. We need to continue to support, um, you know, do gen ops support for, um, you know, organizations. But you know, if we want the long, you know, um, you know, sustainable change, capacity building, systems level change, we should be in that game. Um, I'd say second lesson learned was um, related to that. Um, so um, most investments, I think, I think all of you know, you kind of say you're giving the money in a given year, and then at the end of that time period, you report out impact. On that, um, we learned that. Um, for capacity building, the very nature of capacity building grants, um, they are um, most, I mean, generally they're about sustained, you know, change over time, improvements, more eff and efficiencies, effectiveness. And so to use, uh, you know, a one year, um, you know, investment um, peer time period, uh, reporting period is you're drastically undercounting your impacts. Yeah. And why is this important? It's not important because you want credit as a funder to say we did this. No, it's important because A, um, it helps you better understand the impact of your work and it helps you with your stakeholders mm -hmm. to say, you should give us more money to do more of this work <laughs> because sometimes it could take longer, um, but the impacts are, can just be really, really um, um, large. Um, the third, I would say um, of, of many is just the value of engaging partners in the process. You know, I mentioned that we engaged them from the very beginning. We consistently uh, solicit feedback. Um, I think the result is um, a, a, a product that adds significant, has great quality and you and significant utility um, for our partners. Um, they um, tell us that they better understand you going, you know, using our impact measurement framework helps them better understand their own data. Um, prompts them to make programmatic choices and decisions based on those data. And I'd say, and I'd argue most importantly, helps them communicate um, their data to their stakeholders and frankly, other funders. Really important lessons, Nate. Thank you for sharing. So you did mention um, how you use the data to set targets, to improve your investment strategy. Are there any other ways that you're using your impact measurement data as it's collected after you've worked with your partners to collect it. Yeah, so um, I'd say the, the the first and highest priority are with our fund our donors. So um, you know our um, being able to speak to our stakeholders and tell them um, you know what the the result uh, the results or the impacts are their their generosity is super super important um, and frankly it motivates them to continue to um, write checks. Um, so that's just, um, I'd say the, 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 the biggest piece. Second is that, it, you know, frankly, um, in, in other contexts, it allows us to actually go deep um, with, um, you know, with new partners or existing partners around the data and really understanding how we might have trans transformative work together. Um, and um, and the, the, the third is, they like, and this is just what our partners tell us. Um, you know, they literally take our the framework and our language, and they package it so that they can um, 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 communicate with other uh, with other funders. Um, and that is just they say that it actually has helped them in their um, their their fund their uh, fundraising um, capacity. Can I just add? I think this is why Pimco. Um, if you can't, if you can't tell already, Nate and the PIMCO team are such deep thinkers about this work. Um, and I think one of the most important things that Nate, you and your team do is you just never stop asking questions. You look at the data and you want to get under it, uh, every time. I mean, sometimes I just want to have an easy call and I can't no. because, because <laughs> it means we just, you know, there's so many, it's really great. But, um, a, a couple of things I want to say is the fact that your partners, Nate, are taking their theory of change, their logic model and sharing it with others is because PIMCO is not asking for a specific 
impact report to your donation. It is tell us about your work and what you do. And that means the nonprofits now have a communication tool that is specific to their program, not to PIMCO. And so it allows them to transfer that information. The other thing I'll just kind of double down on here is the reason that Nate and his team can understand that perhaps the geographic, the wear lens isn't as valuable or meaningful as the um, the how, the the kind of the, how the, the uh, investment is being used as a capacity building or direct service is because Nate and team had the right data to look at. They were looking at the end outcomes. And so from there, the team said, why is this number so much higher than this number? And we realized it wasn't because one was in Milan and one was in Orange County. It was because one was doing systems level change and yeah. one was doing direct service. And then the next question from the team was, well, then we, sh you know, is that okay? Like, what does that mean? And so then we started thinking about, does it, does it make sense to have a multifaceted intervention, a multifaceted investment approach? And the answer is yes, because sometimes you need direct service immediately. And sometimes you have time for capacity building. So having the right data allows you to then ask the right questions and asking your nonprofits to talk about their program as a whole gives them what they need to then share that with their stakeholders. Yeah. Sort of a different mindset change too, to not think right. about your own as a funder, you know, what you're directly contributing to, but how that funder can then, or how that nonprofit can then use it to communicate with other stakeholders. Yeah. We've talked a little bit about building the capacity, and, and my next question for you is, for either of you really, is thinking about building the capacity. So they're using the data to showcase their efforts, their impacts with other funders, so obviously hopefully getting new funders. Is there other ways um, that you're helping your nonprofit partners build capacity by using the impact measurement data? So I'll just give two uh, quick examples. Um, one is that in some cases we actually provide funding um, because they, they recognize the importance of data yeah. um, through the process um, and, and unlocking the potential there. So we've actually funded um, uh, nonprofits to, you know, a couple organizations to, you know, build their internal data capacity um, to, you know, better assess and and tell um, their own stories. Um, the second is, you know, so we are at this holistic engagement model. So if we fund you, we're also looking to invest in you, pour into you from a human capital perspective, both skills-based and um, hands-on um, volunteerism and advocacy. So like, how can we um, elevate your voice? How can we speak on behalf of you or the area on, um, or on, on which you're, you're focused? Um, and um, some of our um, skills-based um, volunteering has been specifically in this um, data. And actually it's one of the prioritized areas. It's been around data um, because PIMCO is really, really good at data. A lot of people, that's their, my colleagues' strength and they love to, have, just to transfer that skill set to the social sector, particularly, particularly organizations that you know, they're, uh, they really care about. No, that makes perfect sense. I was just thinking, I wish everybody, every company had some of those, I don't want to say it, but I'll say it, data nerds, you know, yeah. the analysis yeah. piece is hard and to support our nonprofit partners in this way is so valuable, not just again for your own yeah. reporting, but for them as a whole. Yeah. Okay. My last very hard question for you, Nate and, and Sarah, of course, please jump in since you're very familiar with PIMCO's journey. Where are you going next on your impact measurement journey? What's next for PIMCO and the foundation um, besides uh, offering up PhDs to all yeah. of them? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned our big milestone this year was where our goals and targets are North Star. Um, there are two things that we're sort of prioritizing going into this new, this new year. Um, one is um, volunteerism. And, and with True Impact support, we've been able to develop a calculator that um, you know credibly estimates um, lives impacted um, by our volunteering efforts. Um, so this is literally based on our own programmatic data, and Sarah spoke to this uh, a bit. Um, you know, combined with a specific kind of volunteering, um, and I mean it's just amazing that you do um, you are able to apply this and and get an estimate on lives improved. And think about the motivating factor that would be for a firm like ours that. You know, Frank, like, I mean, 
volunteering is a huge part of our culture. 66% last year on, yeah, engaged our volunteering efforts. Um, so it's a big part of who we are. Um, and to be able to motivate them and show them the, 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 the fruit of the collective fruit of their, or the fruit of their collective labor, I think is, is um, just super, super exciting. Um, um, second is advocacy. Um, so we're going to be working, um, we've already given Sarah the heads up that we're going to be working with her on trying to think through like what is the appropriate, appropriate advocacy framework for us to have and how does that connect to our North Star goals. Um, so uh, that's that's on the horizon and um, you know super excited again anyone who's already doing work in those areas happy to collaborate. So basically, it. what I'm hearing is that there will be no easy calls in 2024. Yeah, <laughs> no. Sorry, to sorry to disappoint. <laughs> no, but what a wonderful thing to do. I mean, of course, for PIMCO and the foundation, but also for the sector, because, you know, we talk a lot at Points of Light about volunteering and being civically engaged. And we're always having the questions of how do you measure that impact? But when we think about advocacy, like I don't know that anyone has yet dipped their toe into trying to measure the impact of that work. So kudos to you for thinking about it. And Sarah, thank you for joining that journey. I'm I'm actually, I'm really thrilled. I, it's going to be really, it's going to be really exciting to think about it um, and to think about how do you measure the, the change of conditions in which people live, not just their lives that have been changed. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm really excited to think through it. And I'll also just say, I think what, what Nita is, when he's referencing the calculator, which to those of us that are those impact or measurement nerds, we get really excited when we hear about calculators. But I think the thing really that you should hear from that, if it doesn't pique your interest by calling it a calculator, is it is the ability to extrapolate out to impacts if you cannot directly measure them. So PIMCO is using really high quality data as the basis of an estimate. And that high quality data is data that they have generated with their partners. You also could use benchmarked data, but PIMCO I think accurately said, our, our data, we know our data better, we know our partners better, and the quality of our data is incredibly high. So that is the basis for which they are able to extrapolate out those impacts of the volunteerism efforts, which can really be a helpful concept for those. I see a question here about, look, we have 500 partners that we're supporting. How the heck do we ask them to report? And my thought on that is to think about that possibility of estimation or extrapolation. So can you work with a smaller group to do reporting that you could then use as the basis for extrapolation? Assuming, of course, that you feel really confident in that data, that you're using uh, high quality data or your partners are using high quality data and that they're reporting on the right thing, which is that end outcome and not those outputs. Yeah, that's brilliant. All right. Yeah. And sorry, just real quick, um, in, in implied in this calculator conversation, but should be stated is that it doesn't produce additional work for the nonprofit partner. Brilliant. Yep. yep. It, it literally, it's it's the PIMCO team inputting some information and having that share back to the PIMCO team what those estimates are. But yes, it does not. Uh, thank you, Nate. That, I mean, that was really, once again, the questions that PIMCO and Nate ask yield these kinds of illuminations. But the question they asked was, well, how do we get at volunteerism without asking for more reporting? And so then we got busy at True Impact thinking about that. But so asking, I would say the takeaway in my mind from all of this is start asking the hard questions because that's when you're asking, how do we get this info without burdening partners? Mm -hmm. How do we get this information without confusing the timelines? How do we get them to answer the question of impact versus output? And I have some thoughts on that too. I mean, once you start asking those questions, I think you're already beginning the journey of figuring out your, your measurement approach. That's amazing. Well, and Sarah, if you don't mind, we do have a question in the from the audience about sort of measuring volunteering. If you have thoughts about how to get past the inputs and the outputs, or are those okay to still be tracking and reporting on? I have thoughts, and then I'm curious what Nate, your thoughts are. Um, my, my thoughts are, I think you have you have to have input information. Right. You have to understand the hours that are being devoted to or dedicated to the volunteerism effort so that you could then trans, uh, conf, uh, convert them, excuse me, into the value of that time. Um, and the Bureau of Labor Statistics has some nice rundown of different kinds of volunteerism and the average value of that time. So you have to know the inputs. But I don't. I think without understanding the end outcome, you're really not moving the needle on understanding where your efforts are going. So 
I don't I don't think it's sufficient just to just understand the hours. It you really have to stay focused on what is the end outcome of the program that you donated your time to. Um, and by focusing on that end outcome, you have all the data you need to do, you know, the analysis that Nate and team have done so beautifully. How do you focus on the end outcomes? I think if all of you are hearing me say that and you're thinking, there's so much more to that. Like, you can't just say that and say, that's what needs to be done. And you, you, you're right. Um, and there's so much that I could say. I'll just say this. I think there's a really powerful question you can ask your partners. And it's really simple. It is, and then what? And then what? So we volunteers came in and helped do some painting with the participants of my program. And then what? Well, they they came together in this space and they they worked together and they talked and they shared and they built some relationships. Great. And then what? Well, what was amazing was that these participants kept wanting to come in into these spaces and engage with each other. And these spaces historically have been pretty stigma heavy. So they wanted to keep coming in. That's incredible. And and then what? Well, they they kept coming and therefore they kept getting better services for their mental health needs. That's amazing. And then what? Well, they kept using those services more and more. And as a result, a lot of them showed significant improvements in feelings of depression, in feelings of empowerment, in feelings of uh, well-being. That, that's the end outcome. It went from, we came and did a paint day to yeah. people had significant changes in their well-being and their levels of, of uh, feeling empowered. So the and then what is really going to help move your partners towards the end outcome of their work. Understanding that. Well, and I'll, I'll point out what Nate mentioned earlier too, that that not, that doesn't necessarily happen a year after those volunteers have come in and done that paint project, right? It, it, there is a longer term game that not game, but longer term strategy here and where you can really understand the impact may not be a few months after that project happened. Yeah. It has to be told, you know, a year after or two years after. Um, and I think, I don't know, Nate, if you have any advice how senior leaders can like be patient enough to wait for the real outcomes. I don't know if you have, that's a. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 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 about, um, you know, I think most senior leaders will be committed to the notion of sustainment, sustained improvement. Gotcha. And that's, I think, how you get there. You know, we can, you know, and I think you, you have, it's having a real conversation. You, we can directly impact people right now and it'll be this, but if you want, you know, people to be able to, you know, to, in our case, eat indefinitely, <laughs> you know, be, you know, have increased food security, it's going to take a different kind of investment. Yeah. I will couple that though with the power of forecasting, which Nate and team do. And so if they were to fund the mural arts program, you PIMCO would say to the mural arts program, what will you be doing with this funding? What will this funding support? And the mural arts program should be able to say, look, your, your funding is going to go to some paint days, but I want to be clear that what you're really supporting is the improved well-being of a hundred participants. And that is going to give Nate the data that Nate needs to go to the board to say, we're funding the mural arts program to improve well-being. Right. So, yeah. and then I would come back in a year and update my forecast with, it actually wasn't hundred people, it was 103 or something. But mm -hmm. the power of forecasting is that it allows Nate to have that impact language to go to the board in advance of the impact happening. And it gives the nonprofit the North Star they need to say, look, we're not in the business of paint days. We're right. in the business of improved well-being. And the mechanism by which we improve the well-being happens to be paint days. But we, we're we going to stay focused on tracking our impact, which is well-being. So every everybody has a shared understanding of the intended impact at the start of the grant. Yes. Love it. Oh, my gosh. See, Sarah makes it all make sense in yeah. my brain, which is not easy. It's a jumbled mess up there. All right, I've got one last question from our audience and then um, we'll say thank you to both of you. But Nate, can you share with us how many members of your team are dedicated to measurement? Do you have anybody that's dedicated to measurement or is it the entire team's sort of job to make yeah. sure that they're tracking the impact? So philosophically, everybody owns data. Gotcha. Um, you just, you, we have to have... Um, 
a, a, a at least a rudimentary and probably just a little bit more understanding of data in general and our own data in order to credibly be able to speak to anybody in our organization. Um, that said, um, we have, um, you know, so I said a small but mighty team, we literally have six people globally. Um, so yeah. we're super small yeah. and, um, and we've got, you know, uh, two people who pull our data most, <laughs> yeah. who we go to because we thought centralizing the knowledge base um, and the inter, you know, and all the, um, um, you know, just getting into the fine, fine details. Um, you know, we just thought some, we needed to develop, have some, some, some folks have, you know, um, a deeper understanding of our systems and how they work, but everybody owns it. Everybody joins our True Impact calls, everybody. It's not just, you know, me and those two individuals. It's everybody. everybody. It helps build their capacity their too. Their capacity, that's right. All right, we are coming to the conclusion of our webinar. Nate and Sarah, thank you both so much for being here and for sharing. I know our attendees um, are thankful to have you really explain impact measurement in a way that doesn't overburden the partners, but still gets to the needs that they have for reporting and for um, future investment in this work, right? Compelling their senior leaders to do that. Um, and for those of you out there who couldn't take notes fast enough, please don't worry, we will be sending the slides, the recording, um, and a few takeaways that we've collected in an email that every registrant will receive tomorrow. That that email will also include a survey link. So we would love your feedback to tell us how this went, what you learned from it, and also to help shape future points of light webinars as well. And because we have talked a little bit about Civic 50, I'm gonna put up uh, a slide right here just to show our attendees a little bit about it. Um, the Civic 50, for those who may not know, it is a strategic way to identify areas of strength and opportunity for your company's social impact strategy while potentially being recognized as one of the top 50 most community-minded companies in the nation, like PIMCO. So the survey opens in just a few weeks on December 1st, and we'll also be hosting an informational webinar about taking the Civic 50 on December 13th. And we'll make sure to add those links to the follow-up email that all the registrants will receive tomorrow. And of course, I want to say thank you to everybody out there who joined us today and asked good questions. Um, I know there were probably a million places you could have been in, during this hour, but I'm thankful that you decided to be here with Nate and Sarah and myself. I hope you'll join us for future webinars from Points of Light. But until then, everyone stay happy and healthy and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks again, Sarah and Nate. We appreciate you very much. Thank you for having us.